conceited is a funny experience. <laughs> so what I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes is try and talk about technology in society, but as somebody who invented it, as somebody who was part of it. And by way of background, um, I came from a very privileged background, privileged family. My parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, everybody was pretty rich and cultured and educated. So when we were brought up, it wasn't an aspiration. Becoming rich was not an aspiration. Uh, we were all brought up that you have to, in some way, leave the world a better place than when you arrived. And while it was not said explicitly, one had the luxury to do that. And I chose, uh, as a kid, very interested in art and very interested in math and science to go to MIT and study architecture. And studying architecture doesn't make you automatically a technologist or a computer scientist, but I fell in love with computers while I was in architecture school. And in those days, computers were very difficult to use, so my mission, what I decided I would do, is make it easier to use computers. So that's how I started my career as a professor at MIT. I went from being a student to a professor overnight. It just happened uh, that quickly. And worked on technologies, but from a point of view of design as well as a point of view of computer science. And then over the next 50 years, because I've been a faculty member for over 50 years, I became engaged in many of the things that are natural to all of you. I started companies. I was on the board of directors of huge multi-billion dollar corporations. Um, I dealt with governments all over the world and founded at MIT something called the Media Lab, which was really a salon des refusés, a place that people who were misfits in intellectually and socially misfits could come and do work. I felt that was very important because I had done my work for about 15 years through the enormous generosity of people like the president of MIT and, and very accomplished uh, faculty. And so then I thought it's my turn to build a place which we decided to call the Media Lab, that would encourage people, sort of like me, to come and do work that was considered outrageous, considered ridiculous, but they'd have a license to totally do what they wanted, undisturbed for at least four or five years, fully funded, didn't have to, in other words, it was, it was sort of a, a haven and a heaven for people who wanted to do that. And over the next 25 years, we invented lots of the things that you use today. Um, I remember teaching Steve Jobs many of the things that got him started. So we were also a place people came to. And, you know, I just happened to know all these people, know them well. I was older than they were, and it was a place they could come freely. We weren't guarding information. We weren't keeping secrets. We were wide open to anybody who came, and especially people who funded. So again, I was running a lab, and all the funding was external from big corporations and rich people around the world. 50% was outside the United States. So after doing that for about 25 years, uh, I decided that, first of all, you, you shouldn't be the director of something more than 25 years. That's, that's ridiculous. In fact, I probably should have not been director much sooner. It was doing very well. The lab was still growing. We grew from five people to 800 people. Uh, it's on the center of the campus, and it's operating at about a, an $80 million per year budget today. So it does a lot of work um, and very advanced work undisturbed. It's still very, very protected. So after doing that, I said to myself, it's my turn. It's my turn to, to do something, not just to make a playground for everybody else to do it. And because of what I was doing, I knew of the 100 richest people in the world, I knew 50 of them on a first name basis. Um, I knew 
you know, a couple of dozen heads of state, not because I was famous, <clears throat> but because they came to the media lab, they, they uh, worked with us, and we developed a strong relationship. So I said, when it's my turn, let me do something that takes advantage of knowing all these people and that really does something good for the world. And I should just say as a parenthesis, when I wake up in the morning, I ask myself one question. Will normal market forces do what I'm doing today? And if the answer is yes, then don't do it. I should only do, and people I work with, people I fund, people who are involved with it, should only do what normal market forces won't do. Because that's where new ideas come from. Maybe they work, maybe they don't. But point being, there's got to be some place that creates, if you will, markets by doing what markets weren't doing uh, previously. And as I, I looked around the world, um, I found, and this is now 15 years ago, a place where market forces were doing, in my opinion, more damage than good. And it happened to be in the world of laptops. Because every time the technology made it possible for Intel, for example, to make a faster processor, Microsoft came along and made fatter software that used it. So it was, it was like a little, a, little, a little game that somebody made a faster processor, somebody used more of it. Somebody made a faster, and I joke about it. <clears throat> I joke about it in public talks that it was so interesting that when you opened your laptop, it took it so long for it to come on. And it seemed to take longer and longer, even though the processors were getting faster and faster and faster. And I said, what's wrong with this picture? And what was wrong with this picture was that because of normal business <clears throat> responsibilities and fiduciary responsibilities, a company really wanted to maximize the, the, the laptop, which happened to be at about $1,000. And I said, that's crazy. Because you can build a laptop for $100. So why are we building them for $1,000? And if you build them for $100, you can give them away free to kids around the world and connect them. Everybody said, ha, 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 you can't build one for $100. And we said, ha, 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 you can. And we did. We actually, we got to maybe $140 or $135. It depended on the price of oil, the price of plastic. I mean, I think. point being, it was a lot less. And then we went to countries. And we said to the heads of state, um, Lula was a very active participant early on. Uh, and I said, look, we can not only do this, and he loved it. He used the word non-commercial. <clears throat> His English isn't perfect, but he, he was able to express that he was interested in the non-commercial aspect of giving everybody uh, a laptop around the world. As we did it, we did 3 million laptops in 12 months. Now, if I were starting a business and came to you and said, I want to start a business, and I know in my business I could do 3 million of these, in the first year, you would fund my business, unquestionably. That's an extraordinary ramp up from zero to three million. And it took us about a year and a half, and there were some bumpy parts. But it's, it basically, we got the three million out there to, to about 20, 30 countries. But once we did it, something much more interesting happened. I went back, and I'll use Lula again. I went back and I said, look, I don't really want to build laptops. I, we're a nonprofit organization. Whether we sell them or don't, there's no margin. We build the laptops and we give them away or sell them at cost. <clears throat> but let me help you write the tenders for, in the case of Brazil, they had a one million laptop tender. And I said, not only will I help you write it, I'll bid on it, but I'll bid on it in the newspaper. I will publish my price in the newspaper. We got pretty good front page coverage. Uh, in the case, the way that it was described and the, the tender, it cost us $180 to fulfill, per child, to fulfill the service and support and all the stuff they were asking for. Well studied. Now, 
Because we had built the three million, we had credibility. We had a factory in Taiwan. You wanted, you know, 100,000 next week, I could push a button and we'd have 100,000. Maybe not next week, maybe it'd take a month, maybe even two months if it was traveled by sea. So we had credibility and we published in the newspaper what our price would be for the tender, $180. And guess who won? <clears throat> Person who won bid $179. And that was fantastic. I said, wow, what a great way to promote an idea and to get laptops to kids around the world, even if the $179 person is losing money or it's a lost leader, it's, you know, we can keep doing this. We did it country after country after country, basically forcing the price down. In a couple of countries, we won the tender. Uh, we did it in Nicaragua, we did it, we did it in a few places, which was fine. We, these were honest tenders. And I looked at this picture and I said, this is, this is a pretty, it took us maybe th through the first five years, I thought this was a, a good use of at least my time. I didn't have to start a company, I didn't, I didn't, somebody else was now running the media lab, but there was still something wrong with the picture. And the picture with one laptop per child is it was always going through schools uh, and schools as an institution are not necessarily the <clears throat> greatest inspiration for kids. Very often creative kids lose their creativity by going to school. And that's not, I'm not being sarcastic, I think people have experienced that. So I said, could you, and we ran a small experiment, it was so small I funded it myself, where we brought to a village tablets with tons of material on them. It was tablets, not laptops. That's a whole separate discussion. And we left the tablets in the village in closed boxes. And we left. No instruction manual, no teacher, no, nobody to explain how it worked. <clears throat> and the important fact about these villages, both of them in Ethiopia, there was no literacy. Nobody had ever seen a word. <clears throat> they hadn't seen a printed word. No parent was literate, there was no school, there was nothing. And the kids figured out how to turn on, found the tablets, figured out how to turn them on, which is non-trivial for somebody who's never seen a switch. They turned it on, within a week, they were using 50, five zero apps per day, per child, using the tablets seven hours a day. Within two weeks, they were singing ABC songs, ABC, Latin alphabet, <clears throat> English language, which is not theirs. Within six months, they hacked Android. They, they just hacked into the system. They all speak fluent English today. They read and write. There was no teacher. What did they do? They self-organized. They decided to have, it was, they said, wow, this is, this is like a story. This is like a movie. It's not, is this real? And the answer it is, it is real. And while I'm not advocating we get rid of schools, there are s some number <clears throat> between 300 and 500 million children who have no school because there isn't one. It's not because they aren't going to it, and it's also not because it's so bad it shouldn't count. It's <clears throat> there isn't one. So I thought, that's pretty interesting. And so what I'm doing now, which is what I'll end with, and, and you got, I said, okay, one laptop per child, that's 15 years ago. The experiment was about five years ago. Um, what could we do today? Now, maybe I should retire and live on an island and ski in the winter, but I decided, no, there's one last breath in me. And it's really to change the concept of connectivity. How are we connected? And I mean it in the most pedestrian sense of connectivity. I'm not talking about content. I'm not talking about educational material. I'm talking about how can we connect the three billion people who are not connected today around the world, um, how can we connect them in two or three years? Small amount, how can we connect them very fast? And to connect them, you need to do two things. One thing, you've got to advocate in a way that everybody agrees. 
one of the interesting things in retrospect of one laptop per child, everybody thought it was a stupid idea, and today everybody thinks it's exactly the right thing. They might argue about cost or how to implement it. So how can you accelerate and advocate so everybody agrees that connectivity is a human right? whether it's a human right or a civic responsibility. I won't dwell on the difference, but let's call it a human right. So you advocate, and then you've got to do a plausible system. You've got to show how you can connect everybody, which you can absolutely connect everybody for a total amount of $10 billion. $10 billion sounds like a big number, but it isn't. $10 billion is what the United States wastes in Afghanistan in five weeks, five weeks we waste $10 billion. So it's, it's these numbers at the Treasury or IMF or World Bank level are small, so 10 billion isn't the problem. The problem is the resolve to do it. And we can talk about that separately. But the advocacy part, I said, wow, how do we get people, how do we make this a mission, maybe a new division of the UN, how do we get it into global civics? This can't be done by a country. It can't be done by a rich person. It's got to be done through global civics. And out of the sky, literally and metaphorically, the pope comes along. And the pope likes the idea. The pope says, human rights and connectivity? Come and have a meeting, which we had last week, at the Pontifical Society. Get people around the world to come. Draft a statement, which we did last week. and he signs it and gives it to the Secretary General of the United Nations. It hasn't come in the press yet. It will probably in the next week or so. But in terms of advocacy, I'm feeling pretty good because this has nothing to do with Catholicism or with even being Christian, but the Pope is a good voice, especially this Pope, and powerful voice, and a voice with a moral compass that if you have his support, then you get the, it, it could become uh, accepted. So that's where I am, that's what I'm doing, uh, and I don't know if I've taken the 20 minutes, but I will stop for questions, and they can be about anything. They don't have to be about what I talked about. So <clears throat> let me give you three answers. The first one is, is, is almost, you know, a quip, and that is that Gutenberg did not write the books. And with almost any medium, there is going to be the opportunity to engage in expression of pretty, pretty bad and, and unsavory things. In the case of the, sort of the second part of the answer is there is uh, a very interesting thing about control uh, that worked itself out in the case of one laptop per child very differently than most people um, expected. Uh, out of the three million computers, for example, only three were stolen. And they were stolen by customs inspectors. Uh, they were not stolen by the kids or somebody in the village or a parent taking it from the child and selling it on the market. And we had, in almost all sites, no control over the content. We did not put you know, any kind of filters. And in a few of the sites that I knew, Personally, kids would accidentally, because one of the best ways, or most frequent at least, ways to stumble on pornography is a typographical error. You can make a, a typographical error and find yourself on this weird site. And, you know, the kids sort of giggled a little bit and went on to the next, and they said, and they corrected, and there was a self-policing, which was, was quite remarkable. But now, the third third version of the answer is you can do a great deal through social filtering, through all sorts of means that are very much from the bottom up, <clears throat> that very much reflect sort of a community's interest, perhaps more than, than, than a particular parent or a particular <clears throat> you know, point of view, even from <clears throat> the point of view of a government or a religion. So, they're become, the means to do social filtering have, have gone up. I think it is so important for kids to be connected to learn. And what does learning mean? 
Learning is not the acquisition of facts. It's not that they suddenly have access to the Library of Congress or the equivalent in another language or all material. That's, that's sort of interesting, but the more important thing in learning is learning learning itself. And that comes from a number of things which I could drag out my answer, but in sort of the simplest way to think about it is from the passion and the, the immediate results of knowing something, doing it, trying something, sharing it. That's what it's about. <clears throat> and when we connected the kids in youth Ethiopia and when we connect them in other places in the world, you see some inversions. This happened in Peru a lot. In Peru, we experienced many children teaching their parents how to read and write. And you say, wow, what better picture is that? And the parental relationship with the child didn't deteriorate because the child was, quote, smarter than the parent. There was just a whole different respect. Still, parent was in charge, and no, you can't do this, no, you can't, but learned how to read and write because of the child. And so the role of children in many of these villages, the role of <clears throat> many of those 300, 400 million children who have nothing will be to the agents of change in their villages. And they're wonderful teachers. They love teaching. And they love teaching, especially people who were in positions of authority before. It's not that they're reduced, but it's a point that the notion of childhood is going to be redefined for these kids. And they're going to play a very different role. So, you know, the faster it happens, the better. And as an aside, it does not need to be broadband. The use of the word broadband uh, is, 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 is a very first world concept. You, you know, Netflix, I, I was at the beginning, I used the internet, just to put this in perspective, at a time when I knew every person on the internet, every one, because there were only three machines, two in Cambridge, one in Santa Monica. <clears throat> so we all knew each other. This was in 1970, but it's, a, you know, the internet was a small thing and we, as it grew and grew and grew, we realized that this was going to have more and more. And it was not growing because a government said it should or companies. It, it grew, it, as you know, in a very organic way. It was not available to companies until about 1986. And then only if you were involved as a contractor or sponsor of research. So the internet had a full 20-year run without companies. There was no dot com. And the reason I know that is a student of mine invented the, the name, the, the server, the domain name server. And so dot com didn't exist. Dot, this was a very new, new phenomenon. And as it reaches countries, those kids are doing things that redefine childhood because the technology is so new and the concepts are, are really still very new. <clears throat> I think about it a great deal. Uh, in the specific case of the tablets, they had about a thousand apps. Um, none of them were terrific. They tended to be games where you played the game and it was about letters and numbers. They tend to be children's movies with subtitles in English so you could learn English and hear spoken English. They tended to be books, simple books, children's books that as you read it, it spoke the words as well or it was animated. In rough numbers, there were a thousand. Um, and these tablets in that experiment weren't connected because there were the thousand apps uh, on, the, you know, on each tablet. <clears throat> if you looked at any one app, they weren't great. But since there were a thousand, you, you, you could, no child was doing the same thing. And by definition, they were sanitized. We didn't put anything on the, on the, laptop, on the tablets that uh, you know, was inappropriate for for children. In the case of the laptop, we ran into much less content control than I expected. In fact, the most enthusiastic heads of state were, if I may say, the least democratic. Uh, one of the really most supporters of the early days of One Laptop Per Child was Gaddafi. 
and I spent time with him, and I would go to Libby, and he wanted to do every, and the only thing he wanted is he wanted his face as a screensaver, okay? And I thought, that's okay. You can have your face as a screensaver. It's on every wall you walk by anyway. That's okay. But he didn't want to control content. He didn't want to, you know, do something that was, you know, it was very open to content. And we saw this time and time again. In China, we, I ran into uh, a little bit of an issue because the Minister of Education with whom I was meeting, who, by the way, the Minister of Education in China has 220 million children under his aegis. That's a lot of children. Uh, you know, that's an enormous number of children. And he said to me, Professor Negroponte, your project is child-centric, and our education system is teacher-centric, so we're not going to use it in our country. I said, okay. It's, uh, we didn't need to try and change China, or then we wanted to get examples out there as fast as possible. So China, we just didn't, we didn't do it. We didn't deal with them. Other countries were much, much easier, and there are certain countries, Peru, Uruguay, Ethiopia, uh, that were, you know, Rwanda, especially Rwanda was maybe even the best, where you had a country that really wanted to change it. And the poster child, the poster child today is, in, in all honesty, is Uruguay. Maybe Nicaragua is number two. And they, they've done a really, really good job. And, you know, I was down there because it was the 10th anniversary. I was down there a few months ago, and I was speechless. You know, I had a dream of what it would be, but they fulfilled that dream far beyond my wildest dream of the dream. Um, they, every child in the country, 6 to 18, has a laptop. All the children are connected. Uh, all of them have free telecommunities. All the, there's a whole building where people do nothing but develop software and do the logistics and maintain them and train the teachers. and do. I'm saying, wow, the impact of this, because the, they're still only 19, 20, maybe 21 years old, if you go back the 12 years when we started. So they still haven't quite made it into the <clears throat> productive work society. So we'll see what happens in a few years. But high school in, in Uruguay includes enormous commitment <clears throat> to robotics, to things that we think of as so advanced. It's part of, it's part of their life. I hope that <clears throat> the agreement to do it will be measured in less than a year. And I know you can do it in less than two years. You could actually collect, connect everybody. And the reason you can connect everybody suddenly is, is, is sort of a technical uh, change that has occurred, which is very different than any telecommunications technology uh, previous. And that is, once you're into satellites, whether they're satellites that move or stationary, <clears throat> you're outside the jurisdiction of the country. Country's jurisdiction stops at 100 kilometers, and then it's another body of, you know, it's like law of the sea, and there's all sorts of... So the country has complete control over telecommunication, licenses, frequencies, and so on, up to that altitude. So all I need to do is go above that. And if I were to have a constellation above that, if they're low Earth orbiting, they by definition move. And if they're moving and they're out of the jurisdiction of countries, you don't need the country's permission. And even if the country says it's illegal, says to its citizens, don't you dare connect. And if you connect, there's a three-year jail sentence for you. You know, Countries have said that before, and when I was doing earlier projects, <clears throat> it was Media Lab or One Laptop Per Child, they'd say, yeah, but we don't mean it for the rural parts. If a rural dispensary connects, that's okay. We won't tell anybody. And then it starts happening, and then it's, it sneaks in. And then some people just say, we don't care, and they do it. So 
if you launched this kind of system and half the countries of the world said, don't use it, it's illegal, well, I don't care. The other half will use it and they'll use it free, it's free, and the kids will be connected and the cost is not high. So why not do it? So there are many reasons that countries and businesses won't like this. And so it'll get, there'll be sort of legal challenges, there'll be all sorts of things, but they're not that hard. And since again, I'm doing it as a nonprofit, I'm not doing it as a, a company, I'm not trying to start a business, take that. You, you, you're standing on a little bit better moral platform. I can go to you, if you're a head of state or a minister of education, I can say, you really have to do this. And I'm not marketing. I'm, I'm saying that it is my genuine opinion that you should do this. And by the way, unlike the laptops, it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything? No, it doesn't cost anything. All you have to do is to allow it to happen. And then we'll send people the recipe by the internet of how to build an antenna out of tin foil and so on, or if it's a low earth theory, we might have to, you know, drop something into the, into the country, but with, with stationary satellites, you don't have to even do that. So I think it'll happen quickly. So when I say it could happen in two years, so let's say it takes five. The, the impact of the internet and that kind of con connectivity on both society and businesses is enormous and it's changing. The change is changing. So it happens faster and faster. Um, and everybody does think about jobs because so many jobs <clears throat> start to be those that computers can do or the job is serving a part of the market that's disappearing. Whether that's retail, whether it's the automotive industry that will only have to build one-tenth the number of cars. If all cars are self-driving, you don't need parking, so there are no parking attendants, and if it's self-driving, you have no taxis, you have no chauffeurs. You start looking at the, at the job impact, and that's not a reason not to do it. It's a reason to maybe think of education and the way we, we think of life a little bit differently. <clears throat> and some of the examples of thinking about it differently would be to revisit what a job means. So the, the, you know, we are so accustomed <clears throat> to spending a lifetime usually doing something we don't like. Most of the people in this room probably do like their job. Most people don't. And they do it for a period that they get to some form of retirement, which even is starting to go away, but they would sort of enjoy the fruits of, of having worked. So there's a period and you see it all the time. I meet very accomplished bankers, for example, who have really done very well and they retire at 55 or 60. And what happens when they retire? I meet them and they say things like, let me tell you about when I was in the Peace Corps. And I say, the Peace Corps, but that was 30 years ago. And suddenly, when they look back at their life, the meaning was in the Peace Corps. And then as they go through it, they say, well, now I'd like to do something meaningful. I'd like to do, whether it's meaningful for my family or for myself, it could be reading books, it could be <clears throat> giving back in many ways. Our lives were what I like to describe as a fried egg. The fried egg has this yolk and the white and there's a pretty crisp line around them. Today, the work world, the digital world, society is more of an omelet. It's more intermixed. And that intermixing sometimes frustrating, but other times we actually just look at your phone and you look at what messages are interspersed. And it might be one of your children or a spouse or a friend or in the business. It's all sort of commingled and lots of things are being commingled. It's what we think of maybe guaranteed incomes and things that are were very edgy five years ago, but are being looked at more seriously today. So I think we'll be prompted to look at those things, 
look at what people do. And also, your children will live for 150 years. They will, unlike us who might make it to 80, 85, 90, they're going to make it to 150. And then their children are going to make it to 200. So suddenly, if you have a lifespan of 200, going to school for 12 years is sort of a silly concept. You, you know, in fact, maybe going to school is a more commingled, lifelong thing. So, so many things are going to change. I look at the, the, the change in jobs and the discussions, and almost none of them that I've seen include life expectancy and the fact that it could go up very dramatically. So, there will be the sort of things that when 75% of our populations were doing agriculture and today it's whatever, three or four, um, depending on the country, uh, it's those kinds of change are just going to happen over and over again. And then I also think back to 300 years ago when the rich didn't work. They listened to music, they went on picnics, they did stuff that you see in all the paintings and you read in the history books. Well, was that just Louis XIV and a small circle of people? Maybe more people can do that. Maybe not that everybody becomes idle, but maybe there is a, a point of view about the world that includes leisure and learning and, quote, work in different ways than we have up till now. I think that's where we will find the answer.